So we just saw an example of how Bayesian neural networks work. Can you show us an example of how we can actually use this? Sure, I can show you one in Python. So now that we've learned a little bit about what a Bayesian neural network is and how it works, we're going to walk through a concrete example of how to construct one. To do this, we're going to use the Python programming language. We decided to use Python because the code just is a lot more readable than it is in R. It's a lot easier to understand what's happening when you can read the code. We're going to use the Atom IDE, which is most commonly used for Julia, but basically any programming language can be used in Atom. We're also going to use the TensorFlow API, which was created by Google. It's a very high-level API, which lets you focus more on the model itself and less on the code. The last uh, module we're going to use is Edward, which will provide us with our distributions and models. So this gives us our normals and our categorical model and lets us set a random seed so that we can reproduce our results. So in TensorFlow, they have great tutorials that will teach you how to build uh, neural networks for all kinds of things. We're going to be constructing a Bayesian, Bayesian version of the MNIST neural network, which is a set of handwritten numbers, 0 through 9. And the neural network is meant to take in some of these, learn from them, and then given a new set of handwritten numbers, it should be able to classify these correctly. So the, the TensorFlow tutorial is using a frequentist version of a neural network, but we're going to start constructing a Bayesian one. So I already have the code prepared, so we can really just punch through this example. I'm going to be explaining what some of the lines are doing because I know most people aren't familiar with the Python language, but it's really known for being readable and easy to understand. These imports at the top here are the same as using our library function. They're just taking other functions, methods, and models from other packages and loading them into the kernel so that we can use them here. Because TensorFlow uses the MNIST example as one of its main tutorials, they have the data ready and prepackaged inside the module. So since we imported TensorFlow itself, we can just load the MNIST dataset without much effort. See, it just extracted it from the module. This is going to show that we have the training dataset. It's MNIST.train, and this is just its object reference, which we're going to be using later. This is Edward. We're setting our random seed so that we always get the same result. So I'm not surprised while I'm making this video. Uh, we're going to load all of the images in mini batches, and we're going to use 100 mini batches to train the model. The number of features is 784. This is our D. 784 because each handwritten image is a 28 by 28 pixel uh, image. And what we did is we flattened those pixels into one long array, 784 long. And that array is just a bunch of zeros and ones about whether or not there's any black or white, basically, in that pixel. Our K is our number of classes. Since our data set is classifying 0 through 9, we have 10 classes. So now we're ready to start building our model. To do this, we're first going to create some placeholders. These placeholders will define the structure of the neural network without using any of the actual data. The first placeholder we're going to make is x. So this is a float placeholder that is just saving space to put our 784 length arrays into. And we're going to create two normal priors one for the weights, which is this W here. So this is using a location of zeros and a scale of ones. And our biases, B, is doing the same thing, a location of zeros and a scale of ones. Our Y is going to be our response. And this is categorical because it's 0, 1, 2, through 9. And really all we're saying is that we want to matrix multiply our x 
and our W together, and then add B. So we're taking our we're taking our array, and we're going to matrix multiply that by a weight. So each pixel is given a different weight, basically its importance. And then we're going to add some bias to all of them on the same uh, scale. And then that function is going to give us our Y, which will then be used to classify whether it's a 0, 1, 2, or so on. So at this point, we, what we would like to do is be able to use Bayes' rule to calculate our posteriors from our data and the priors we just set up. But since that's intractable, we're going to have to use something called variational inference instead. What we're doing here is we're creating approximating distributions, QW and QB. And these are going to approximate the actual posteriors for the weights and the biases without having to actually calculate them. This code is just telling uh, TensorFlow that it's going to use a softmax regression and it's going to use the KLQP function from Edward, which is a variational inference technique. Uh, KL, these are two people, I can't really pronounce their last names, but what it's doing is it's checking basically the dissimilarity between the true distribution and our approximations. And it's going to iteratively try to minimize that difference. So to do that, we have to set these up and then load up TensorFlow, which these are just initializers. So it's just getting TensorFlow ready to run. And then when we get here, this is actually going to start the iterations. And it's going to put the data through and calculate those softmaxes. So it will take a minute to run, but you can see the loss is actually going down. And this is that divergence between the true posterior and our approximations. So now that we've trained the model, we're going to load some test images and the correct answers, the correct categories for what those uh, images are. And then we're going to run them through our model and generate samples of the posterior distribution. So we're going to create 100 samples for each image. These are just empty lists for the samples, the weights, the biases. And then down here, we're actually doing that. So this for loop is going to take the testing images and calculate those uh, posteriors. This actually takes a while, so I'm going to pause and come back. So now the model is finished uh, calculating the samples of the posterior distributions, which really what that was, was we were taking each image and we were drawing a random weight from the, the posterior of weights that we calculated and a random bias from the posterior of the bias that we calculated. Then we're using those, that weight and bias combination to categorize the image into one of the 10 categories. And then at the end, because we have 100 of those, that's going to create a distribution of what we think the image is. What, how this differs from a frequentist version of a neural network is the frequentist would just do it once, and then you would have a point estimate, and it would tell you, hey, this is a 1. What the Bayesian version does is it allows us to have a little more uncertainty. Because we do this 100 times for each image with different weights and biases, it might say, for any given image, okay, we're pretty sure this is a seven, but a few times we got a four or a five or something like that. And then it can see what it got most often and then use that as the actual estimate. So the last thing that we're going to do is test the accuracy of the model, really get an idea of the uncertainty. To do this, we're gonna sample basically every combination we can from the posterior of the weights and the posterior of the biases, and then use all of those different samples for each testing image that we have in our testing set. We're going to check the labels against what the uh, neural network thinks it is and what the actual label is, and then we're just going to plot a histogram of those accuracies. So in the histogram, we can see really the uncertainty of our model. We can see that for some 
random samples of weights and biases, we end up predicting with mean accuracy of about 89.5% or even a little less. But more often than not, most samples uh, from the posteriors actually give us pretty good accuracies in the 90s, the low 90s. The last measure of accuracy that we're going to be looking at is taking the mean probability for each class across all of the weight and bias samples that we took earlier, and then comparing those predictions with uh, the testing data. And we can see that we ended up getting a 92.4% accuracy in predicting the test data. I'm going to take a picture of this and then process what this number is. Oh, you have a Bayesian neural network app. Yeah, I That's think it cool. works. Hold up, let me put my glasses on. I should probably put my glasses on. I should too. Oh, you got a 15. Hold on, hold I'm on. sorry. Oh, what? <laughs> you got a 15? Well, I got a 74. So at least now we know how to use neural networks to find our grades. Yeah. <laughs>